The jury in a civil trial against the former U.S. president has found Donald Trump liable for sexually abusing magazine writer E. Jean Carroll. The former U.S. president has been ordered to pay his victim $5 million in damages. What do you say to voters who say it disqualifies you from being president? Well, there aren't too many of them because my poll numbers just came out. They went up. Okay. When America's former president, Donald Trump, lost his court case last week, some thought or perhaps hoped his chances of making another run for the White House were over. Well, some expected he'd be legally barred from running. Others thought he'd lose all his support. But they were completely wrong. Not only is Donald Trump still allowed to run, he leads the race to be the Republican nominee by a country mile. She's accusing me of rape. A woman that I have no idea who she is. It came out of the blue. She's accusing me of rape, of raping her. The worst thing you can do, the worst charge. The minute I was in there, he shut the door and pushed me up against the wall and bang, bang my head on the wall and kiss me. I just, it was so shocking. In 2019, when Trump was still president, the writer E. Jean Carroll accused him of raping her back in the 1990s. You remember Donald Trump, hail fellow well met, walking up and down the streets of New York, greeting everybody, everybody liked him. He You're talking about hello. 1995, 95, 96. 96, he was Shakespearean. He was great. You'd love to see him on the street. So when we met in Bergdorf's and he said, help me, uh, advise me to find a president, I was delighted. I was thrilled. But according to Carol, their encounter took a dark turn and she wrote about it in her 2019 New York Magazine article and in her book, which she promoted widely. Today, the president of the United States was accused of rape again. Thank you very, very much for being here tonight. That was a ravishing introduction. He shut the door behind us and threw me up against the wall and kissed me. I couldn't believe it. You know, he's a large man, mm -hmm. not as large as he is now, but he was, you know, 6'3". Mm -hmm. President Trump immediately denied the allegations, initially claiming it never happened. I never met this person in my life. He was later made aware of this picture taken sometime during the 80s. There's some picture where we're shaking hands, it looks like at some kind of event. I have my coat on, I have my wife standing next to me, and I didn't know her husband, but he was a newscaster. But I have no idea who she is, none whatsoever. Trump's denial infuriated Carol, and she sued him for defamation and battery under the Adult Survivors Act, a New York law that allows alleged victims to file civil suits even after the statutes of limitations have expired. Carol's lawyer, Roberta Kaplan, was given the opportunity to question Trump before the trial during what's called a deposition. When you said that Ms. Carol was not your type, you meant that she was not your type physically, right? Uh, I saw her in a picture. I didn't know what she looked like. Uh, and I said it, and I say it with as much respect as I can, but she is not my type. Kaplan then showed Trump the photo of him being introduced to Carol. And for a moment, Trump mistook Carol for his second wife, Marla Maples. I don't even know who the woman, let's see, I don't know who, it's Marla. You say Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's, that's my wife. Which woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, is that? The person oh, well. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Who is that? Who is this? Point, your wife. And the person, the woman on the right is your then wife, I don't Yvonne? know. This was the picture. No. I assume that's John Johnson. Is that that's Carol? Because it's very blurry. Kaplan later played Trump the now infamous Access Hollywood tape where he was caught on the mic boasting about what he could do with women. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. You can do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what it's... If you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. The trial began six months later on April the 25th in federal court at the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. Trump never attended the trial. 
The jury of six men and three women reached a unanimous decision just two weeks later on May the 9th. They found that on the preponderance of the evidence, Carol had not proven that Trump had raped her, but that he had sexually abused her and defamed her. They awarded Carol $5 million in damages to be paid by Donald Trump. When the verdict came, yeah. when the verdict came, uh, I think we ascended to the ceiling. We did. And it was the happiest day of my life. Mm. And uh, on top of having the happiest day of our lives, was added, uh, we were so proud to be an American and see democracy actually work. Mm. What else can you expect from a Trump-hating, Clinton-appointed judge who went out of his way to make sure that the result of this trial was as negative as it could possibly be. Speaking to and in control of a jury from an anti-Trump area, which is probably the worst place in the United States for me to get a fair trial. The whole thing is a scam, and it's a shame, and it's a disgrace to our country. Well, Trump being typically bombastic, now, as I mentioned, the civil trial does not legally prevent Donald Trump from running again for president. Truth be told, it hasn't even slowed down his campaign. In fact, he was back on the TV the day after being found liable for sexual abuse, dominating a so-called CNN town hall meeting. Manhattan jury found that sure. you sexually abused the writer E. Jean Carroll and defamed her. You've denied this. But what do you say to voters who say it disqualifies you from being president? Well, there aren't too many of them because my poll numbers just came out and they went up. <laughs> okay. This woman, I don't know her. I never met her. I have no idea who she is. After the town hall, CNN got together some Trump supporters and asked them if the Carroll case affected their support for the former president. I didn't really care. Why didn't you care? I don't know enough about the case. Um, women can be victims of abuse. Women can also make up stories. I mean, we see it all yeah, the time. I mean... So I don't know. All of these situations where people are coming out 20, 30 years later, I don't listen to it. Well, lots to talk about with our guest, and today we're joined by Jennifer Harrison, the founder of Victims Rights New York, Jay Tidmarsh, a professor of law at Notre Dame University, and finally we have John Gizzi, chief political columnist and White House correspondent. Welcome to all three of you. Jay Tidmarsh, I'd like to start with you. A lot of people at home will be wondering, how is it, given what happened in the civil trial, how is it that uh, Donald Trump is able to run again for the presidency? So the United States Constitution imposes only a few qualifications and disqualifications to be president. Uh, it is not a disqualification to be president to have been found liable uh, in a civil trial. So there's no reason why uh, uh, former President Trump could not run again. And strangely, uh, we've read, even if it was a, a criminal conviction, Apparently, it would be possible for him to run again, and if he were to win, to even run the to run the country from prison. Well, that would raise some really interesting questions. But you are right. Uh, even a criminal conviction, other than for uh, supporting uh, rebellion and insurrection, would not disqualify a president from running. How they would do it from prison, we'd have to work that one out. Well, that's an extraordinary uh, scenario, but it could happen. Uh, let me ask you about the difference between a criminal trial and a civil trial. Uh, please take us through the differences, including the burden of proof uh, and, the, the, you know, the, obviously, the possibilities of sanctions against the, the defendant. Well, the principal differences are these. So a criminal trial, of course, is brought by the state against the defendant for allegedly at least committing a crime. Uh, a civil trial is brought by a private person whose rights have been violated, trying to get uh, some sort of remedy for themselves. On the criminal side, uh, we're usually talking after a finding of guilt about either jail time or maybe probation, maybe a fine. Uh, on the civil side, uh, usually the victim obtains money, uh, sometimes a court order called an injunction, but it's just a different kind of a remedy. And the remedy, of course, goes to the victim directly in a civil trial. Uh, as you also mentioned, a criminal trial has a very high burden of proof. We will not convict someone in the United States unless it's said that they have been found guilty by a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. There can be no doubt in the jury, no reasonable doubt in the jury's mind that this crime was in fact committed. 
On the civil side, the burden of proof is considerably lower. We use a couple of different burdens of proof, but the most common one is what's called a more likely than not or a preponderance of the evidence. The jury only has to decide by about 50.1%, just slightly more than likely, that the plaintiff's uh, claim is in fact uh, a good claim in order to find for the plaintiff. So when I hear major news networks saying that uh, Carol managed to prove in court uh, that Trump uh, sexually abused her. Uh, that's not quite right, is it? She didn't prove it in so much as she persuaded the jury that Trump probably carried it out. That's right. Um, she proved more likely than not, or probably, uh, that, uh, that she was battered by Donald Trump. Well, that is a massive uh, stain on, on, a, on a person's reputation. Uh, given that the jury is essentially saying, yes, he probably did it. it. It doesn't mean that he did do it. They're not certain he did it. But on the balance of evidence, they think he probably did it. Is that right? It's a big, it's a big stain on his character, though. Um, and f that is the level of proof? That is correct. OK. Let me ask you about uh, the various uh, uh, mischaracterization uh, that we're seeing in the media as well. I'll give an example. Congressman Eric Swalwell has tweeted that the GOP is now the party of a convicted sexual abuser. Now, he is a congressman and has used the word convicted. Why is he wrong to use that word? Well, conviction is a criminal term. Uh, you are, and I believe um, uh, Representative Swalwell is a former prosecutor, uh, so maybe he thinks in those terms, but uh, a conviction is something that happens in the criminal process. Donald Trump has not been convicted of a crime. This is a civil proceeding instead. Uh, and uh, it, it, what he was uh, found liable for, that's the language we use on the civil side, liability, what he was found liable for was a battery. Uh, not uh, a rape or sexual abuse as such. Uh, he was found liable because he battered uh, E. Jean Carroll and then subsequently defamed her by claiming that what she said was false. Why do you think it is, uh, you may not be able to answer this, but why do you think it is the jury believed uh, in the, the battery claim, the sexual abuse claim, but not the rape claim? Well, in a civil uh, case where the claim is one for battery, you don't have to prove rape. You just simply have to prove that there was a harmful, uh, intentional, and unconsented to uh, touching. Uh, that's all that's needed to be proven, and the jury believed that because they found that uh, sexual abuse and forcible touching had occurred. It wasn't. It isn't necessary to find rape uh, in order for uh, mm. the battery to have been made out. Why they didn't find, in addition to uh, sexual abuse and forcible touching, why they didn't find rape, I don't know. I was not there. I didn't see the evidence. My understanding, having read reports, is that there was some conflicting evidence about whether what occurred would have met the uh, statutory requirements for a rape. Uh, Jennifer Harrison, let's turn to the evidence now. And uh, Trump and others have expressed doubts about Carol's allegations. Uh, what were the main ones? Well, I think the fact that it happened in a such a public arena and in, at Bergdorf Goodman, which is a very high profile store with a lot of people around, um, casts a little bit of doubt on whether anybody would have witnessed this or, or whether it was um, even potential for it to happen. Uh, let's take us back to 95, 96. Actually, this is another issue. Uh, Carol couldn't remember whether it was 95 or 96. Um, and what uh, Donald Trump's uh, profile, even then, was incredibly high. Uh, would people not have remembered him going into the store? Would those uh, store attendants not have been all over him? Yeah, I mean, he was very high profile and very extremely high net worth. So, uh, you know, everybody in that store would have wanted to make a commission off of Donald Trump. And apparently, E. Jean Carroll spent a lot of money there as well. Um, so people would have been all over them trying to sell them things on a continuous basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, she... that she can't remember... The, yeah. Sorry, the fact that she can't remember what date or what year it happened is a little, you know, a, a, victims process trauma and, and grief and, and in different ways and react in, in different ways. So I don't want to judge a victim based on her reaction or not remembering certain things. But traumatic events like that, you tend to remember or be able to have some kind of time frame. And it also wasn't fair for Donald Trump's defense that he couldn't provide some kind of alibi or defense for where he might have been on that day. Right. H had the date been specified, he would then have been able to check his diary and so on. Uh, of course, to be fair, 
Uh, the jurors were aware of all this, and on balance, they still found what they found. Uh, Jay Tidmarsh, uh, just a quick question about uh, something that Jennifer just mentioned. The, the lack of a date being provided by Carroll, did that not hamper Trump's defense? He couldn't come up with an alibi. He couldn't say where he was on the date because no date was mentioned. Well, certainly it would have hampered his defense. It also would have hampered um, uh, Ms. Carroll's ability to bring the claim because uh, I think the inability to uh, state a particular date was one of the lacks or lapses of memory that um, uh, Mr. Trump's lawyer exploited during the trial. So um, it, it's in a sense, though, it's not unusual um, that in any, any civil trial that there are some large gaps in the evidence. There's some, some information that people would love to have, but it's escaped people's memories and attention, and we do the best we can. That's one of the reasons why we have the burden of proof. Uh, as we do, uh, there's a risk that people won't remember things, and we have to try to sort it out as best as we can. That's just yeah. the nature of, uh, of trials, which rely uh, a great deal on human memory. As we know, it, it all happened a very long time ago, and the statute of limitations had closed uh, on Carroll's case. Uh, John Gizzi, uh, Trump and his supporters suspect that the Democrat-run New York changed the law to, for just one year so that uh, people could uh, produce civil uh, a case against people like Donald Trump um, that go back, that, that, that doesn't, you know, has no regard for the statute of limitations, and then that window closes in November this year, and the statute of limitations goes back to being normal. They see in that change of law political motivation. John Gizzi. Well, certainly there's enough circumstantial evidence especially given Democratic Governor Hochul uh, a handsomely Democratic-controlled state assembly and a majority of Democrats in the state Senate all to do this. Now, whether they all came together in collusion with the idea of focusing on one individual, Donald Trump, could be questioned. But I would say there's certainly enough circumstantial evidence for Trump and his supporters to make the case of selective prosecution, so to speak, that you mentioned. Jay Tidmarsh, is it possible that Democrat-controlled uh, New York changed the law specifically to allow Carroll to go after Trump and to, to put an end to his, or try to put an end to his run for president in 2024? So I don't know. Um, I, there is, as uh, John said, perhaps some circumstantial evidence, you could argue it. But uh, at the same time, um, I think the statute uh, in many ways grew out of the larger Me Too movement. Uh, a number of uh, victims of Bill Cosby have used the statute, and probably the most um, numerous number of cases uh, under this uh, this uh, extant, expansion, or ex extension of the statute of limitations have been brought by uh, women that were in a notorious prison where uh, rapes occurred mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite regularly from the staff. So I I'm not sure that I would say that this is a statute for intended for one person only. Um, it certainly has been used just, more broadly. Would you mind just reminding us about why the United States even has statutes of limitation? Well, it's usually said there are two reasons for statutes of limitation. Uh, one is that uh, it helps to prevent stale evidence. Again, our trial process relies a great deal on memory and on documents. So memories fade, documents get lost or thrown out uh, as years go by. And so it makes it more difficult to get at the truth uh, as, you know, as it's, uh, the, the claim has occurred more distantly in the past. And the other is to give peace of mind to the potential defendants so that they don't continue to have to look over their shoulder uh, for the rest of their lives, wondering whether or not they might be sued for something that happened 30 or 40 years ago. So those are the usual policies that are you know, said to favor a statute of limitations. But you know, again, statutes of limitation cut off potentially uh, valid and valuable claims they do so for, for good reasons, uh, but they do cut off potentially valid claims. Uh, John Gizzi, uh, Trump's lawyer complained uh, to the judge, Judge uh, Lewis Kaplan, no relation to Roberta Kaplan, the, the lawyer uh, of Carroll, that Carroll's legal fees had been paid by Reed Hoffman, a billionaire Democrat donor who founded LinkedIn, strange enough. Uh, the judge wouldn't let it be known to the jury that that was the case. Can you tell us a bit more about Reed Hoffman and, and why, and he's admitted it, he's not admitted it, in fact, he's acknowledged it in a positive way that he funded Carroll's uh, legal team. 
But, but why is this important in America? Reid Hoffman is a well-known Democratic contributor and contributor to liberal causes. Uh, I would say very much the way that conservatives invoke the name of George Soros, the Hungarian billionaire who backs liberal causes, invoking Reid Hoffman in New York as supporting a defendant or someone else adds fuel to the claims that this is a selective prosecution. Now, I'm certainly not saying it is. I'm saying the involvement of Reid Hoffman, just as the involvement of George Soros, uh, is a red meat issue in certain cases, certainly got Donald Trump's supporters worked up and even more supportive. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Harrison, it, it's obviously it's crossed your mind, uh, the Reid Hoffman involvement. Tell us more about that. Right. Well, obviously, there's an entire machine behind this case and supporting E. Jean Carroll to give her her day in court, which, uh, listen, I'm glad that she got her day in court. I feel like all survivors should get their day in court and all accusations should be thoroughly investigated. But that should be done not based on who the accuser, who, who the survivor or victim is accusing or their political party or how the um, accuser or victim can be weaponized against a political candidate. It should be done based on the, the pure fact that victims need to be supported and wanting to get down to the truth and the facts of the matter of, the, of each individual case. And it shouldn't be based, you know, we have Tara Reid, who has a very credible accusation and has been, you know, uh, validated by by many different factors in her case. Her mom went on Larry King, and she still hasn't gotten her day in court because there isn't a machine attacking Joe Biden, and that's not fair. Victims should not be weaponized for political purposes. John Gizzi, uh, we're coming towards the end of the program. I need to ask you about what this has done, this civil case has done, to uh, Donald Trump's chances of winning the Republican nomination. We saw the CNN town hall the very next day. And uh, people seemed, his supporters and others, seemed still very ardently uh, in favor of him. What's it done to his chances going forward? Well, it has enhanced his following within the Republican Party and the conservative movement already. Uh, the verdict came shortly before the appearance, as you say, on CNN, which is widely judged by people um, across the political spectrum as a Trump triumph. In addition, we know that just this week, the report of the Durham uh, investigation regarding Russian collusion came out, and it essentially said there should never have been um, any investigation because there was no evidence. Yet another triumph for Donald Trump. Uh, the fact is that the more that people pursue these cases against him, the stronger he gets among people, and I'm going to word this carefully, who are likely to participate in Republican state conventions and primaries to determine a Republican nominee. Now, timing is so important in everything, and whether this will be the case uh, at the end of the year, when the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary start remains to be seen. John For now, it. he's gotten a boost. And John, you know, he, he may have strengthened his position with his ardent supporters, his base, as people are fond of saying. But what about with American voters in general? Because that, that's important, isn't it, for the, for the actual election? Well, it certainly is. And the one thing I would say that if the economy is bad, if Russia has overcome Ukraine, um, if interest rates keep going up, uh, I can tell you that should Donald Trump be the Republican nominee against President Joe Biden, then this particular case in New York will be an asterisk in recent history, and that's all. I might add that Voters today are a little more cynical and a little more hardened about politicians. Their personal foibles do not seem to have been the poisoned uh, pellet that they were some years ago. Bill Clinton started this. I mean, he had some serious charges against him 
that led to his impeachment, and he survived it all and ended office as a popular president. Uh, Clinton, like Donald Trump, has never pretended to be anything other than a flawed man. In other words, people knew what they were getting on the personal side when they elected these people president. Uh, and so it really is not a shock to their supporters or the public in general. And I would also say, if this were Mitt Romney, who has a very different public persona, well, I think there would be some blowback on it. John Gizzi, Jay Tidmarsh, and Jennifer Harrison, thank you all very much for your contributions to The Nexus today. Much appreciated. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye.